Okay, back at the hobby table. Now, uh, first, in talking about paint, before going into any kind of, you know, basic techniques or anything, uh, there's a couple of topics I'm just going to talk about. So, uh, this will be, first part here will be a little bit more of a discussion than anything else. Uh, and just to, to get a few, uh, hopefully clear a few uh, misconceptions out of the way. Now, there are a lot of people doing on YouTube, uh, doing uh, videos with some in incredible builds. And uh, if you're at all interested in the hobby or already in the hobby and interested, I, I'm sure you've seen some of them. And I think if you're even interested in getting into the hobby as well, you've seen those things. And it, it kind of uh, brings up uh, a big point that I, I want to address here, which is this. Is an airbrush a requirement? Uh, when you look at what some people do with their airbrushes, um, they're amazing builds, and, and anything I'm saying is not to be taken or misconstrued as uh, critiquing some of the incredible work that, that people do with airbrushes. The reason I bring this up is I look at this, you know, I've called the channel Practical Plastic. Uh, I've stated that you know it's for the casual hobbyist because i think the hobby has a lot of enjoyment to offer but for people who look at it they may watch you know what some advanced modelers are doing and always they see the airbrushes and if you're interested and you start researching airbrushes you know you're looking into hundreds of dollars of expense uh the paints you know it it gets very expensive very quickly and i think for for some people they may look at it and think that that is the only way to get a really nice build and it's a, a turnoff for lack of a better expression so is an airbrush a requirement Ta -da! not at all uh you can build uh very nice uh kits you can have great outcomes without ever touching an airbrush uh, I, for one, over the years, I, I've looked at it as, you know, the, the way I like to build my models. I mostly uh, build cars, trucks, things like that. I really have not had any interest in doing dioramas, which an airbrush would be a very important part of building dioramas. Uh, I really, although I built many military models when I was a teenager, um, it's really not my my main source of interest so there is where people really go in deep with with weathering effects and rust effects and things like this and again these, these are things where an airbrush uh really uh, asserts its its presence as uh more of a necessity than an option but uh if, if you're going to build things and you, you just want to paint and have a nice finish and and have it look well you can get by with with regular uh, rattle cans, you know, spray cans, and um, you know, bottles of, of paint. And you don't need a huge inventory of colors. Uh, that's the second thing that I think you know may be daunting to people when they they watch um, some other uh, people do their their builds. They see you know racks and racks and shelves of of different paints and. You know these things that there's obviously a a dollar attached to a dollar amount attached to all these things and it can add up very quickly um you know what you see here in front of you that that's my spread of bottle paint that's uh that's what i have and it works for everything that i'm doing and that is a key phrase for what i am doing there's no doubt about that but you know as you get into the hobby or as you, you work with the hobby you know, you, you're going to find there's something that you're particularly drawn to and you will end up accumulating a a color palette so to speak of of paints that you work with and that will carry over from model to model to model so obviously at some point the paints run out or you know they, they dry up whatever they, they need to be replaced but um you know, it's really not necessary to have a giant, you know, collection of paints. Plus, the other thing to consider, uh, talking about colors themselves, if you build a model, even, 
you, know, you, you open up your typical car model they might list 20 different colors and you know mix this with that and you know you, that's that's not written in stone so if they say you know this has to be one blue this has to be another blue well you may look at it and just go well i, I have a you know regular blue and i have a dark blue so there we go i'm done and off the shelf they come so you know if you're getting to the point where uh you're want to enter your models in a, a judging competition then you know that's a different story but you've also moved to a different level of commitment so um you know that that's an answer a question that that basically answers itself but the big thing is to understand if you want again you do not need to lay out uh this huge investment in uh you know in a, a piece of equipment that uh, you know, if you don't like the hobby, is end up just going to sit there. So let's put that aside. And now we'll talk about the different types of paints. So we'll start with Tada enamel paint. Now, enamel paint, if you go into any hobby store, probably the, the most or one of the most prominent paint displays you're going to see is from a company called Testers. And uh, I think. You know, certainly as uh, kids growing up, you know, this 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 is what you always saw for paints. Testers enamels in these little bottles. Now, enamel paints are oil-based, so you will need thinner to clean them up. Uh, this is, you know, pretty stinky stuff, so certainly uh, need to be in a area where you have some, some air, so that you're not breathing that in. And now, uh, as I go through these, I'm going to talk about your, your pros and cons. So with enamel paint, uh, in terms of pros, enamel paints dry with a, a very resistant surface. And enamel gloss paints, if you get an enamel with a gloss finish, these really will come up glossy. They, they, they can really uh, shine for you. Um, when you paint with them, because... They do take a longer time to dry, which is sort of a con, but on the pro side of that, uh, they are somewhat self-leveling, so uh, brush strokes will, if you don't gloop the paint on, the, the brush strokes will basically disappear as the paint dries. Uh, obviously, you're not going to be, you know, painting an entire body surface of a car, let's say, with a brush, you would have to spray that, but... Uh, if you're doing, you know, things like seats, uh, a dashboard, you know, an engine block, uh, you know, basically along those lines, this will work uh, just fine. Uh, so that's enamel, and uh, depending on where you buy these, they're, they're uh, you know, it, it's hard to say because the price can vary, but, you know, 2 or $3 a bottle, uh, does this one have a price on it? I find, personally, that at Hobby Lobby, the... Prices are pretty good here. This one's only a dollar ninety-nine. Um, the only thing is, you know, obviously a dedicated hobby store, and you know, I'll always say support your local uh, hobby stores. Um, obviously, they're going to have a much better variety of paints than a, a generalized store like like a Hobby Lobby or a Michaels or something like that. Um, of course, from internet uh, hobby sites, you, you can order paints and have them delivered. Uh, but, you know, then there's shipping. Uh, there's nothing like holding the paint in front of you and getting to see the actual color of it. Okay, so that's enamel. So next we'll talk about acrylic. Now, acrylic paints are water-soluble. Uh, we have, to me, it does a lot of acrylic colors. Um, acrylic paints are really nice because they dry quickly. They basically don't have any odor. They have the water cleanup, so you don't have to worry about having the uh, good old bottle of thinner at your side. Uh, they tend to cover uh, very well. Uh, some enamel paints can be, you know, depending on the color, they may be a little uh, watery. But I, I really um, have been very satisfied with uh, the finish of acrylic paints. Now looking at my supply, you'll see that uh, it's mostly enamels that I have. Um, with these colors, that's just a personal preference that I've gone with the enamels, but uh, these acrylics are really nice. Uh, 
Testers also has in their Model Master line acrylic paints with these uh, round bottles. Uh, these are really nice too. These are, I believe, they're about two or three dollars a bottle or so. Um, you know, these paints will last you a long time. So the enamel paints as well. Uh, it's rare that I use all of a paint bottle before the, the paint unfortunately dries out. Um, you know, I build at a little bit of a slower pace because of other uh, time demands in my life. So sometimes I go to open a bottle and find out that I'm not using that color that day. So, but that is acrylic. Now, to me, the biggest drawback of the acrylic paints is the finish is much more delicate than the enamel paints. An enamel paint, once it dries, and it, it may take, uh, you know, tack dry, workable dry, a few hours. Really, you need like a full 24 hours to get a good, solid, dried shell on an enamel paint but once it's dried it it's pretty resilient it, it's it'll stand up to uh quite a bit acrylic paints the coat will go on uh, quite a bit thinner uh, but it is somewhat fragile and it will scratch very easily uh, so you you when it comes to handling you really have to watch it uh, you know if you scratch it fine you, you touch it up but um, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. So if you're going to be painting an area where you still have a lot of work to do, you know, maybe an acrylic is something you want to reconsider. Um, that's, that's something to just learn through experience and personal preference. Uh, last but not least is a lacquer paint. Now, I don't have any lacquer paints. Uh, I have not used a lacquer paint. I only bring it up here because if you go and look in a hobby store, you will see a section for lacquer paints. Um, they are more expensive than the, the other types of paint. They are from uh, what I gather, and I just did a, a little bit of research on them, so um, you know I wouldn't sound like a knucklehead here <laughs> talking about them, but um, apparently they are... Um, quite volatile there's there's a lot of uh, strong odor with them uh, there are um, some pros to them they dry very quickly uh, they are supposed to give you a very nice uh, finish particularly if you're using glosses uh, gloss uh, coats uh, but uh, you know there, there are some cons with them as well the the smell the cost uh, so you know if that's uh, something you want to experiment with uh, you know be my guess but uh, that's just par for the course with this you have to experiment a little bit so that's painting in a nutshell I talked in episode one about brushes which I give you my little handy spread here and uh, you know once you, you you start building you will very quickly have your little collection and uh, you know the next time you, you do a model your stuff is there and you're ready to go so uh, next part moving on we will talk about spray painting and some painting from bottles and some uh, basic technique when it comes to that okay so stay tuned All right, so let's talk about spray painting. Okay, so here is uh, a very typical a 124th model body, of course, Chevy Nova, if you don't recognize it. Classic, uh, classic lines there. But uh, I took this out so uh, just to demonstrate. Now, the steps I'm going to describe here for spray painting are... Uh, generic steps they will apply to uh, pretty much anything you need to do for spray painting uh, because I'm going to talk about it in terms that would apply to any type of model you want to do uh, I just happen to have a car here so I'm going to use that as my stand-in okay now uh, first thing you may notice when you open a kit and you, you read the instructions they will say to wash your parts before you do any painting uh, 
this is particularly true for spray painting. Now, when I was a kid, I didn't wash anything because I figured eh, it's all in a box. Well, what, how could it be dirty? Uh, really, <laughs> what they were talking about is to clean up uh, artifact uh, chemical residue from the molding process. Now, when these kits are molded, you have your mold, you have the hollow inside, which becomes the body, and the plastic is injected in there, injection molding. The mold is opened up after it's dry, and pop, out comes uh, uh, your, your waffle, <laughs> your, your uh, piece, whatever it may be. Now, to get a clean separation from the mold and the plastic, there is an agent sprayed in there called releasing agent. And it's sort of like a lubricant, for lack of a better term. And when you look at a model, when you look at the plastic, you may see spots where it actually looks a little oily. And that is the residue of the releasing agent. The reason why this is an issue, spray paints really won't adhere to the releasing agent. The releasing agent typically is a silicon or oil base from what I've read and you know it, it blocks the paint from adhere, being able to adhere to the plastic. So if you want to uh, take the first step to making sure you get good results on your spray job you will have to wash those parts. So what do you use? Well all the things I'm going to describe in the next few steps uh, they're Sort of like the worst kept secrets in the hobby world, so nothing really special. There's this stuff called Simple Green. Uh, this is great, non-toxic, biodegradable. Uh, you can pick this up any you know hardware store, big box, uh, you know department store. Um, I think this jug was ran me about ten dollars, so can clean a whole lot of models with this because you don't have to use it straight. Um, I just I have a tub which I'll show you in a minute. I fill up the tub. I just, you know, eyeball a little douse of this stuff and I scrub away. So, simple green, your stuff to use. Now, as far as where I do my wash, I got a little basin. This cost me all of a dollar. Typical uh, car model body fits in there nice and simple. So, I'll have the solution of the water with the simple green. A simple brush. This is like another $1.50 or whatever. And just gently scrub the part. Take it out. Dry it off. And then you'll be ready to go. So that's your cleanup. Simple enough, right? So the next thing is now that you've cleaned your stuff, it's time to paint your stuff. Now, good idea use some primer um, now you can go into uh, you know bigger expenses by buying you know like uh, name hobby brand primers and um, personally I, I don't see a big advantage in using them except uh, again if you're doing airbrushing you can have a real fine spray but again that that's not that's overkill for something like this. Um, you can go to your, your local uh, hardware store, uh, homeowner store, and get a can of this. And this will do, um, I think I'm one, two, three, four, four or five models in with this. And um, still quite a bit in there. Okay. So you'll do a primer coat. So you'll, it will then be gray. And the primer coat will now add, you know, a real good bonding surface for your spray paint. Now, when it comes to spray, you have all sorts of choices for colors. You can go with hobby brand paint, like this tester's paint. Uh, this stuff works great. Uh, I found even on uh, models that I, I have not primed, this uh, tester's spray paints, they tend to adhere very well. Now... Uh, very important caveat to that being not all colors cover equally well. And I'm not just talking about color saturation. I'm talking about the way in which they will bind to the surface. Uh, some colors are more susceptible to being painted without a primer. Um, that's why it's a good idea just to prime to be safe. But 
something like this, uh, especially a flat, uh, flat paint, you know, typically I, I just spray it right on. I don't do the prime, but I do uh, clean it first so it adheres well. You can also go back to uh, this stuff, you know, uh, good old Rust-Oleum paint here. Uh, pretty much without belaboring the point, you can get any kind of spray paint that says it's safe to use on plastic, and you can use it. And there's, you know, plastic, safe plastic, you're good to go. So, obviously, uh, you have a lot more paint in this can than you do in this can. These two cost uh, about the same amount. This might even be a little bit more expensive, depending where uh, you buy them. And that's mostly, I believe, because you're buying a hobby uh, dedicated paint. Um, again, that's my guess. I don't know that for sure. Now, when you paint... Whether it's the primer, one of these hobby paints, uh, a Rust-Oleum paint, you know, or, or a similar brand. When you go, you know, you're gonna, obviously going to hold paint before you even start painting the car. And obviously going to be in a well-ventilated area if you don't have a paint hood, you know, be in an open space. Uh, my paint hood happens to be my garage, so there you go. Uh, Low-tech. <laughs> but... Uh, have a space you know lay out cardboard newspaper whatever um you can make or i should say you can buy special wire stands to hold up your oh there we go that was a good example to hold up your body so you can get all the way down to the sill lines uh i tend to use just some scrap cardboard and some tape and stick the body on there it works uh just as well but when you go to paint you will shake up your paint that's the key sound. You got to hear that ball rattling around in there. And take a test shot off to the side to make sure you get a clean spray. Because the last thing you want to do after you clean and prime and take a shot and find out you have a clogged cap and you just basically sneezed on your model with paint. Um, that would not be a happy day. But you'll take your test shot to the side. And once you've ensured that you have a good spray, you will make your passes and i say passes specifically because you do not want to hold and just go because you will goob it with paint you're going to end up with runs it's going to look like a mess you want to just make your passes and work along uh with a car body since this is what i have here obviously you have different planes to paint so along one side across the back across the front Make a pass across the top and then the other side. Um, the biggest thing to remember, especially if you're doing multiple colors and you have masking and, uh, on a body, but even if it's, if it's one color that you're doing, you are always much better off doing two thin coats than one thick coat. Uh, if you goob the paint on, if you go with a thick coat, not only will you get runs, but a lot of these fine details that are molded in the body, you're going to lose them. The paint's going to cover them over. It'll be too thick. They'll be lost. And your model will end up looking much more toy-like than scale-like. If you go with uh, multiple thin coats, you know, two... I've never really had to do more than two uh, thin coats with a color, uh, particularly if I've primed... Um, Two thin coats will basically do it. Uh, when you spray it on, it's thin. You won't lose the detail. And when you do the second coat, you can go with a nice thin coat again. Because you're not trying to saturate it with one thick coat. Okay. And then, at that point, you'll be done. Uh, most of these paints will, will tell you, you know, an hour of this or that for it to dry. I have found when I'm, when I'm doing painting, whatever I have sprayed... I, I let it sit overnight, and then the next day I will do the next coat. Um, haste makes waste. You know, you, you, you don't want to rush it, because if you, you rush it and the paint's not ready for another coat, you know, now, now you got a big mess on your hands. Uh, also, when you spray, environmental factors, not just talking about having ventilation so you don't choke on this stuff, but temperature is very important. These nozzles tend to be uh, very fine. If you've looked at a, a spray can nozzle, it's a tiny little aperture. Uh, you also want it warm enough so that the paint comes out in a nice smooth spray. And 
if it's too cold what will happen is the paint will actually start to dry between the can and the surface and instead of a very fine coat of paint you will once again get splatters and globs and you'll get that sneeze effect on the surface obviously you don't want that um, so I always keep my paints stored inside uh, where I live my basement doesn't get that cold in the winter when it's chilly uh, you know I bring them upstairs and, and I let them sit in my kitchen for a little while while I get a little space heater cranking in my garage so that uh, I have a warmer space to paint and you know I've never really had a problem with that now speaking of mistakes should you make a mistake and you have to strip a coat of paint you can of course resort to sandpaper which you know that's a little bit of a dicey proposition because if you go a little too far you will take off detail that's molded on the body or you can use some stuff called purple power and it comes in a jug and it's purple and the nice thing with the purple power it as well like the simple green is a uh, it's, it's basically non-toxic and you can let your model sit in a bath of that that I use straight you let it sit there um, and over the hours it will eat into the paint and then you can take the brush and you can scrub and it'll, it'll take the paint right off and uh, you know if you've primed you can get uh, pretty well right back down to your your primer so um, you know I, I have had uh, one instance where I had to do that and uh, I was very uh, very relieved that it worked as well as it did so that's spray painting in a nutshell and uh, you know to give you an idea what you can do with a simple rattle can this is from a spray can this is from spray cans um, you know here's another one from spray cans you know not to belabor the point but you can see you can get a really nice finish without having to get into huge expenses okay last thing I want to say on this topic after you spray sometimes you know you'll be working with the model a lot and you'll be handling it and you know you don't want to accidentally get a thumbprint of something on the paint this is where the plastic bags that your parts come in can be really handy because you can use it, either use one of these or even you could take saran wrap and wrap it around the model and you can use that to hold and then you won't have fingerprint indentations or you know stains anything on the paint so very simple trick to protect your paint while you're working and that's that so next segment I'll go over uh, brush painting and uh, then I'll have all sorts of goodies for other little tips in this episode all right. All right. So let's talk about brush painting. Now I'm on a relatively tight focus here because we'll be looking at you know some small details here. Uh, really, what I'm looking to do with this is just show you a few little basics uh, in terms of using brushes and these paints. Now, if you've done any kind of uh, painting, like painting in a house, uh, th there are certain, uh, you know, basics with handling a brush that, that are universal. So you, you don't want to glob your brush with paint. You don't want to have drips, runs, things like that. You only want to use as much paint as you need to cover what you want to cover. So now I'm going to be using uh, an enamel paint here. It's a nice testers uh, dark blue. Um, but what I'm going to talk about with these enamels will basically hold true for your acrylics as well. So first thing when you use uh, particularly these enamels, your thinner, which you're going to use to clean up. I always keep my thinner off to the side away from what I'm doing so it's safely out of the way where it can't be spilled. 
So once you have your paint, give it a good shake, which I already did off camera. And we open this up. And now the natural thing to assume would be, well, you know, paint this paint, but actually your paint will behave quite differently depending whether you're taking direct from the bottle or you're taking from the cap. Now, again, this, this holds more so for enamel paints rather than acrylic paints. But enamel paints, as soon as you open the cap, they, they will start to dry and tack up a bit. So depending on what you need to do, you may want to look to take some paint from the cap rather than the bottle itself. But since this is a 2.0 hobby brush and I just want to demonstrate a few basic strokes, we'll go from the bottle. Now this right here, you'll see there's a big goob of paint on the brush. This, this you want to avoid, as I was saying before. You don't want to have big drops of paint because that will go on sloppy. So we'll take some of that off. And this is more what you want to see when you put paint on your brush, which is pretty even coverage on the bristles. And when you paint, you just stroke it on. Now, this is white, and I'm doing a dark color. So, of course, some of the white is going to show through. And I did that on purpose so you can see how the thickness of the paint, obviously, is going to give you a color saturation. But that if you put it on very thick, you'll notice you're going to get some texture on the paint itself in the reflection of the light. This will flatten down somewhat as it dries, but you really want to try to avoid this, which is why the same rule that goes with uh, spray paint basically goes with brush paint, which is that two thin coats are better than one thick coat. Of course, my fingers look very thick on this tight focus. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so if you're having or if you notice some kind of a coverage issue because of, of differences in colors, um, you know, go with one coat and then go back with a second coat or you can do a primer coat you know pick a it doesn't necessarily need to be primer per se but for something like this you could go with a gray initial coat and then the blue on top of it uh, you could also do a black depending how you want to affect the color saturation on the top coat so that's that now with a 3.0 hobby brush we can do some more detailing and this is where going to the cap might be something to consider and as before so you can just see a little bit of paint on there now suppose this was uh, silver paint and we were detailing rivets on I mean uh, bolt heads on a racing engine or something with this amount of paint you can see just dabbing it you can get nice little dots now it's kind of like an eye exam and yep i still can't see squat <laughs> uh anyway now i don't have a raised surface here to touch up i'm just free handing on here but you can see there's a difference in that versus going into the bottle first of all it's hard to get uh uh, you know a tighter control on the amount of paint going on the brush you can see there's a bit of a goob there and again using the aforementioned hypothetical it takes a lot more control to try to get those little dots and uniformity becomes an issue you also don't want if you have too much paint on the brush when you go to touch a small surface detail what you'll end up having is the surface tension of the paint will actually suck the paint down onto the surface of the raised area over the edge and then onto the surrounding surface and then you have to go back and do a touch up and that'll look sloppy now the other thing again going back to our cap we have a little bit of paint on there as this tacks up you can start to do other little things little freehand shapes like we can draw a face and now see here I'm pressing harder on the brush so we get a broader stroke if I want to do more of a fill area I can put a little more paint on there and 
you can make a bigger smiley mouth. Like so. But now if you wanted to add little corners, that would require less paint on the brush and a bit of a lighter touch. Now a lot of this stuff, it's very hard to demonstrate because it comes with practice and knowing your brush. Um, you know, brushes are kind of like people. They have a little bit of their own personality. Uh, some paints kind of have their own personality as well. So a lot of this is stuff you'll just have to experiment with. Um, a good thing to work with to, to kind of learn the, you know, how your brush is going to handle and how paints flow when you're practicing. If you have a kit with a part sprue, if you look at the number tags on the spot part sprue, those are usually raised numbers. And you can come in and try to pick those out either from coming straight in and painting the surface to get a number. Or you can even practice some of your dry brushing technique. With dry brushing, you're just going to put some paint on the brush. Usually on a cloth you would do this. You will try to get off as much color as you can. And then, if this is vertical, you would try to come down almost 90 degrees off vertical and just brush along surface detail. Now here I'm on a smooth piece of styrene, so it's not really going to give the desired effect. Well, I thought I was going to have my allergies pop in for a visit, but just to illustrate the type of motion you would use. And I'll, I will talk about hand brushing and some of the builds I do, so you'll see that. So that's just a quick uh, you know, example of some of the things you can do with a brush paint and your different hobby brushes. Of course, when you're done, cap that up. And it's good to develop a routine. So when I paint, when I'm done with the color, I cap my color. I put it aside, and then I get my thinner and clean my brush. And you can just do it like this. And once it's clean, you can cap that stuff up again. And if you have a nice piece of old paper towel, a um, little backstory I used to call this a chicken cloth. Well, still call it a chicken cloth. But when my brother and I were growing up, uh, and we would be painting models and miniatures and things like that, uh, we always call this a chicken cloth because when you go to wipe your brush, you end up with these two little splotches of color. And they always reminded us of chicken feet. So there you go. But it's just a piece of paper towel, and that will do the trick. Okay, so that's painting from the bottles and using brushes. And now in the next short segment of this episode, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, different adhesives and uh, oh, just a quick little bit on uh, getting good results from water slide decals. So, I'll be right back. Okay. So for this last little episode, we're going to talk, or I should say, a uh, section of this episode, we're going to talk real quick about a couple of uh, different things you can use in your uh, building process. So most obviously, we'll, we'll start with um, adhesives. Now, I'm saying adhesives because the first thing I want to talk about is the difference between glue and cement. Now. Commonly, uh, the words are used interchangeably, but actually they are uh, two very different things. So, to make it uh, very simple, a glue is an adhesive, and it takes two things and basically just sticks them together. So the materials have something holding them together, but they themselves are not bonded together. The material surfaces themselves were not altered. So if the glue itself fails, the pieces come apart. Now a cement actually, uh, think of it more like welding. You partially melt the surface of the materials and then they join and dry. 
So now to get the materials apart, you are actually pulling and separating material that has, for the most part, become one. So it's a much stronger bond. So when you're building, this is really what you want because your model will not only uh, go together more securely, but it will stay together. Uh, glues, especially, uh, you know, in the old days of model glues, um, sometimes they would start to dry up and pieces would, would chip off and you'd build a model and a year or two later it, it starts to fall apart on you and not fun. So there are lots of brands and lots of different types of uh, cements out there. If you go to a hobby store, uh, certainly if you look on some of the uh, hobby websites, you will find page after page of uh, adhesive types. But for me, my uh, fave is this uh, good old-fashioned, simple testers uh, liquid cement. And I use this on just about everything I build. And it works like a charm. It's fast drying. So uh, if you're working with small parts or parts that have relatively tiny contact areas, uh, you really only have to hold it in position for, you know, a few seconds and it'll already start to tack. Uh, in my experience, uh, pieces that, you know, don't want to stay together, um, holding them together for, for even 30 seconds, they're pretty well set. Uh, but as with most cements, if you really want to have it set so that, it's done uh, like if I'm gluing big things together like a like a chassis to a body I will uh, you know strap it with rubber bands clamps whatever I need to do and then I will leave it overnight and then that's it it's done um, this stuff is not viscous but it will not chase into seams so if you have two pieces that come together and there's a little gap if you lay this stuff down, it's just going to sit there next to the seam. It's really not going to run in there. And, of course, you would have to then push those two pieces together for the cement to do its thing and, and bond those. So, for getting into real tight areas, there's this stuff, Tamiya Extra Thin Cement. This is great for areas where, let's say you have two pieces that come together but it's a it's a narrow seam you really can't get in there with this applicator so you can go in this has a little brush inside so you take off the cap and there's your applicator brush you can see that it's a very fine point and you just brush that along the seam and this cement will suck right in there and bond along that seam line so it's real handy for that when I am gluing, like I, oh, <laughs> see, glue. When I'm attaching something, like I said before, uh, relatively large parts, I will use a little bit of this to give me my immediate bonding. And then I will go back and put this in and other contact areas, knowing that it, it's going to chase in underneath and bond it up. Now, this stuff, as you can tell, it's, still in its packaging because I haven't tried it yet. I uh, spotted this recently. One of the things with these, if you get these on clear parts, they will either leave a haze on the clear part or they're going to leave a clear, I mean, a, a visible smudge. So that will really ruin the appearance of a clear part. And when you're attaching like a like little light, a uh, little... Uh, lamp covers, signal lights, you know, tiny things like that. These really are not your, your best choice. So I bought this stuff because it does not haze the parts and it dries clear. And this is uh, testers, clear parts. There we go, cement. And you notice on there it also says window maker. Apparently with this stuff you can actually lay a bead and it will dry and create a strip of clear material. I haven't tried that, but um, certainly something to consider. Now, how much does stuff like this cost? It, these are about $6 a piece. So, you know, really not that expensive. And you do get quite a bit of mileage out of them. So, you know, not, not anything really 
uh, difficult. Now, when it comes to decals, you know, really the final dressing on any model kit will be the uh, water decals. Uh, sometimes if you're building something stock, there is very little to do other than maybe, say, a license plate and maybe uh, some little de details like a brand name, okay? But sometimes if you're building something that is, let's say, not quite stock, there may be lots of decals to do, as you can see on this kit. So, when you work with, with water slide decals, you know, obviously always read the, the instructions on the back because the it, it's really just the timing. The timing varies uh, some as to how long to leave it in the water. But, you know, you don't want cold water, but basically, uh, you know, lukewarm to the touch water. Have a little, uh, you know, cheap old plastic container like this. You cut it, you put it in there. And then onto the model it goes. Simple, right? Well, not quite. If you really want good results, I strongly recommend, strongly recommend this stuff, Tamiya Mark Fit. Um, it comes in two kinds. This is the regular Mark Fit, and they have a Mark Fit Strong, which uh, apparently works uh, even tighter. And what this will do, this will not only give the decal a better bonding to the material, but it will help it adhere to curvatures and over surface uh, details which is really important because otherwise if you don't use this stuff you're going to have bumps and wrinkles and you know it, it becomes a real headache as to getting your decal to sit down this is usually the way people refer to it to sit down on the surface and give a good adhesion and this is real simple to use this as well if you unscrew the cap it's got a brush applicator, and when you put a decal on, you just brush over the area where the decal is going to go. You put the decal on, you set it in place, you dab it dry, and then I usually wait like a minute or two to let the decal set a bit, and then you go back and you put this on a second time, and that will really bond it to the surface. If you have details underneath the decal let's say like rivets you know bumps contour lines something like that you can do multiple applications of this apply let it dry apply let it dry and the decal will slowly but surely sink down and settle on top of those and you won't get the wrinkles or anything else so um this is about four dollars but really a, a huge helper two other things i'm just going to cover real fast when you're done with the model, some people go crazy with different gloss coats and clear coats. Um, this is uh, like, you know, the worst kept secret in, in the hobby world, especially on uh, YouTube. But this stuff is great for doing gloss coats. And it's nice to have a final coat over your decals to help uh, preserve them from drying and, and chipping over time. Uh, this one bottle, you know, this, this is like $8 or so. You can get this from any uh, uh, big box, uh, you know, department type store. And I think it was about $8 for this humongous bottle. Uh, a good chunk of this my wife had used on our kitchen floor, so it is multi-use. But this is great because you can just go in with a brush. You, you brush it all over the, the model and it will self-level. It won't leave any runs. It will dry and... You'll have a nice uh, gloss coat on there. Now, to give you an example, this was an old, old model that had been sitting on a windowsill, a large, uh, I mean, on a shelf by a window, a large scale Bel Air. And this paint had basically been ruined by the sun. It had turned gray, it had lost the sheen, it even started to crack. Two coats of that pledge and Look at that. You can get our reflection on there again. Hello. So that's how well that works. Now the other little bitty thing that I wanted to show. When doing a lot of this little detail work. A little jeweler's uh, headset to magnify what you're looking at. Um, my wife gave me these for uh, Father's Day. Because I guess she 
kind of just too comical watching me build a model with my nose practically in the model <laughs> as my eyesight has uh, taken a turn south but uh, they're not expensive certainly when you're dealing with uh, some very small decals and detail parts maybe something you want to invest in down the line so that wraps up that now, in the next episode I'll talk about some little tips little things you can do uh, to add some uh, detail to your kit and then uh, that'll wrap this up thanks for watching and see you next time okay so here we go and looking at how to repair unsightly seams on some assemblies now in this case we're looking at a driver seat passenger seat from an interior detail and you can see right along here we have a gap line now many times on plastic models when you have one of these they will blend away with paint and um, depending how the structure goes together you may not even be able to see these gaps but on something like a seat not only is this type of a seam going to be really noticeable it also makes the model look really fake uh, and if you want any kind of degree of, of realism uh, certainly to keep the consistent with the detail that has been invested in the model it's good to fill these up so that's what we're going to look at and it's pretty simple to do first thing you want to make sure of and you'll see that I have scraped down with my exacto knife you want to make sure that the two surfaces of the parts are on plane with each other so that you don't have and it's a little difficult to see against the white background of the mat but you don't want to have one side higher than the other because that's still going to create a problem so in a situation like this you start with the exacto knife you scrape down until our two sides are even and then we're going to use some of this some handy dandy modeling putty this is from Tamiya notice I've already got my glove on uh, reason for the latex glove uh, whenever you're using your finger on things you have to remember you have oils on your skin you don't want those getting mixed in with, with whatever product you are using because they may cause adhesion problems so and also you don't necessarily want these things on your skin uh, obviously read all the user instructions but basically what we're going to do is just put a little dab on there that's obviously way more than we're going to need and you take your finger and you just smooth it in and you see the crack the seam goes away now this is the first step of what is basically a three-step solution so the first is to put the putty on that will be allowed to dry and we'll work it in on this side once the putty is dry you want to go back and sand it so it's nice and smooth I'll do our other seat and once you sand it you will then have a nice finished surface without a gap and then it's paint time you paint over the area that has been sanded and puttied and when it's all done you won't even know the seam was there which is exactly what you wanted to go for now this is something like I said in many cases you won't even notice uh, when something is done um, I rarely do this on a model in fact to do this one I had to go out and buy myself a brand new tube of the putty so that's all it takes to put it on done and then the next step would be to sand which will come up next and then to paint and then we'll have the finished product okay 
Okay, so here comes the second part of seam repair to make our seats or any other bond, bond for that matter, any other gap in plastic look good. Now, put the putty on, allow it to sit for a couple of hours. It's nice and dry now. Now to just jump ahead a little bit to show you the finished product here, sanded, painted, and now the seam as they say in France, voila, it is gone. So, so that's what we're going to do now to show you quickly how to finish that up. This one still has the putty on it untouched. Now we take a little sandpaper. This happens to be 800 grit. That is a pretty uh, delicate grit. Uh, remember with sandpaper, the higher the grit number, the less abrasive it is. So if you go to a real low number, like a 200 or a 300 grit, that's that's pretty coarse uh, paper. When you get up to 800, 1,000, you're a pretty fine grit. Uh, when you get up to, let's say, uh, 2,000 and above, that's really like uh, polishing paper. Uh, probably don't need to go quite this fine with the grit to sand this, but with plastic models, which are made of styrene, uh, it's a fairly uh, scratch prone surface so you want to make sure that when you're sanding you don't go and create something else for you to be repaired rather than fixing up what you already tried to repair so good tip your finger is a nice surface to get in with the sandpaper and you're just gonna work the surface until you're sure there is no residual border of where the putty was so that you are nice and smooth and it takes a little bit of turning and working but already we are almost done here and particularly when you go into contour surfaces like here on the seat we go into the curve from the upright cushion to the lower cushion you want to make sure that you get in there and get that cleaned up nice. Now also something to consider, it does not have to be absolutely picture perfect because some of this will be disguised over by paint. Some of it will be difficult to see. And the human eye, as much as it is pretty adept at picking out things that don't match. It will also overlook things that are part of a greater area, especially once painting is done. Now the other thing you want to be sure of, and why I like to use a nice fine grit of paper, is you don't want to sand to the point where the putty starts to crumble and the seam reopens. So here we are. We're pretty good now. So I'm just take a nice cloth. You can wipe that off. So there we go. And you can see some of the dust from the sanded putty on there. We certainly don't want that on there when we go to paint because then it will flake loose. Now, I used an acrylic for the original coat. Let me do that a good shake. Get that ready to go. I'll pop this guy open. And this is just... If this will cooperate. <laughs> See that? You know what they say about live TV. Something always goes wrong. Okay, so now we just paint right over it, and of course since we do have some finished paint detail on here, you do want to be cautious of that, and you can already see, even though this paint is just applied, but when it's first applied, of course it's wet, everything wet is a little glossy and the good thing with that is at this point 
anything glossy will show up every little surface defect that can possibly be found so if you're applying your paint and it all looks good while the paint is wet chances are you nailed it and you are done and now when we look of course you can see the gloss on the paint but you can also see we're nice and smooth now now I'm not going to bother touching up the black now I just wanted to show the completion of working the putty and repainting the surface so we'll do the other side of the seat and we are looking pretty good now during the sanding we wound up with some exposed plastic here of course that just gets covered right back up with the rest of everything that we're painting one of the nice things with these acrylic paints is as they dry they blend very well into their former coat some paints uh, obviously color individual color has a lot to do with it but from coat to coat it will stick out but here now of course we have the black detail which needs to be touched up but for the actual C color you can see we're all done so these seats look pretty good now as the paint dries if there are any rumply spots or rough spots they will start to show up certainly with the gloss of the paint there you can see there is a little bit of surface imperfection but really not going to be too concerned about that because since the seats are not mounted we can always mount a rough side next to the door panel and then you really don't see it so sometimes you have to uh, be a little clever to save yourself some work obviously if this was a side that was going to be an open view if the putty job is done you paint it you let the paint dry come back and look at it and it doesn't look quite the way you want it well sand it down and take another shot at it another coat of paint and then you'll see for sure okay so now i'm going to clean the brush and that is that for filling putty All right, so let's take a look at something different and talk about engine detailing. Uh, one of the ways you can really make your model uh, pop, especially in terms of your engine detail, is to do some wiring on your engine, do some black washes on your engine. Um, this will really bring out a lot of the little things that maybe you know a, a casual observer will not notice, that, but you noticed assembling it because you're working with the parts. But these are uh, two things that are, are relatively uh, simple to do and they, they really add a lot to the model when it's done um, you know, black washing I, I've talked about in uh, working with paints uh, doing a black wash you can bring up a lot of detail on cylinder heads uh, valves uh, carburetors I'm sorry uh, valve covers uh, you name it um, it really is something that will take all the little molding detail that you could get on an engine and and bring it to light so and it's it's a very simple technique you just make the wash um, get yourself your hobby brush brush it on and if there's excess you, you, you dab it off with a, a q-tip or uh, a dry tissue or paper cloth once it dries a little bit and you're good to go so obviously we have an engine in work here and you can see I black washed those cylinder heads and it brings out the ridges and the um, imprint of the uh, logo on the cylinder head so that's pretty nice and they give you a look at a finished model see it's sitting in there and it does even with all the other detail going on it sticks out pretty well and here we go this is 
a 120th scale and the black wash on the air intake allows you to see some more detail there also on the cylinder heads now on both those engines you can also see the wiring that was done so let's talk about that now as the second part now you can do two options to do your wiring first we'll talk about this one which is a complete distributor and ignition uh, I'm sorry a spark plug wiring kit so to speak now you notice what you get in here which is really handy you have an aluminum piece that has all the wires coming out of it for your cylinder heads and there is an extra wire for the coil should your engine have a piece for the coil and you choose to wire that as well uh, you don't have to attach these wires they're already mounted in there so all you have to do is bore a hole or open up the hole where the plastic distributor piece fits and insert this instead and then you have your wires you also get a piece of the spark plug boot material which you bore holes into the uh, cylinders of the engine you cut small pieces of this fit them in there those are the anchor points for the wires themselves these are flexible wires so as you bend them and conform them to the shape you want they will hold that shape they won't spring back at you measure them insert them cut them and um, final fit and you're all set your other option is just to get uh, wiring without the distributor piece uh, obviously you would have to hand drill the holes in your distributor to work this in but in some cases as with this model we have this is a Nissan uh, hard body uh, 4x4 pickup the Nissan distributor is set up a little bit differently than your typical American uh, V8 uh, distributor that you see on so many models with the wires coming out the top these came through the side so there was no need for me to have the aluminum piece I hand drilled the hole through the side and ran all the wires through and then into the cylinders like so and that was done so here's a more classic so to speak American style performance engine here eight cylinders the distributor is actually nestled back against the firewall that's going to be difficult to see but of course I'm sorry uh, there it is right up front <laughs> got lost in my own engine bay so you can see the wires coming out into the cylinders you can see this was orange wire with black cylinder boots and then we even had a piece for the coil that's what I meant to talk about just before the coil was buried there back against the uh, firewall and that last wire goes to the coil and it gives a nice uh, detail but also a little contrasting color obviously if you're doing a motor that is more towards a stock build you're not going to have wires with all different colors and everything but if you want to dress up a stock engine just a little bit you can use a different color to highlight the wires or if you're doing a racing engine you can get into brighter colors and really make things stand out as I am doing with this engine right here now this whole thing you can do in three pretty simple steps it only takes about 45 minutes to add this to your models engine first part is with your hand drill as I said you will bore out the hole to make sure the shaft of the distributor can fit in there the next part will be to again use your hand drill go in there and drill out the holes for your cylinders this is a V8 so we have two banks of four you will then cut the boot material to size you just need about an eighth of an inch um, you know if you're one of those metric people a couple of millimeters will do and you can slide that in the hole and fix it with a little glue and in the last part the third step will just be to 
get your tweezers. Ta-da. Bend that around and fit it in. And once you have it measured, you pull it back out. You can cut it. Oops, hit the camera there. And then slide it back in. You may not even need to glue it because the wire, as I said, will bend to form and stay in place. And it's your engine bay. No one's going to be going in there and uh, monkeying around with it once it's done. So, there's a work in progress. And you can see two of the three steps. The third step is very simple. Any extra wires that you don't need, this engine does not have a coil piece. So I won't be using that wire. You can just snip that down at the base of the distributor and that's it and you'll be all set. Okay, so let's take a few minutes and talk about detailing a dashboard. Uh, this is a 1 uh, scale dashboard from a VW Golf GTI model. As you can see it's still on the sprue which is probably the easiest way to work on these details because the dashboard itself is not all that large to begin with and while it's on the sprue at least you have something big to uh, hold it by as you can see from my finger not that big of a piece okay so when you do a dashboard you're going to start with your base color uh, this one is relatively simple it's just semi-gloss black for the whole thing then I went in and I started doing some contrasts with some flat black for the vents, speaker grill, vents across the top, the defog vents, which you can't see right here. Once that was done, I went in with my hobby brush and did some dry brushing to bring out the slats on the vents. Now, these were raised on the mold, so it was easy to pick them up. When you dry brush those, you're just going to take a little bit of paint on your brush tip. You brush it off on a rag till it's basically dry. And then you just come in flat across and work it on the, the molding until the lines come out. Now this is not the actual brush I use. This is my bigger brush, but I'm using it to point out because it's nice and red and bright. And then the last part would be to do your decal work for the gauges. These decals can be a little tough to work with because they are tiny, but you clip them out, take your time, a pair of tweezers, a tiny little jeweler's screwdriver I find works really well because they have very fine tips for using to position the decals, and then some mark fit solution will seal those down and keep them in place. Now, those are the basic steps. Uh, if you don't have a kit with gauge decals, if you have molding detail in there, you can use either, some people use color pencil, you can use the dry brushing like I described for the vent detail to help bring that out. But typically, your gauge faces will be black and your detail will be silver or white in there. Uh, on some racing vehicles, the gauges have a white face and black detail that's something you'll have to see with the kit but aside from color variation it's the same basic steps so right after this I'm gonna have some pictures of uh, dashboards I've done on some other kits and you'll see sometimes it's just a different top color with a black bottom whatever the case may be for the model that you're working on if you're not sure or if you really want to be historically uh, accurate of course go to the internet that's the uh, the source of everything so you can find your information there okay so take your time with it and if you pay attention to your detail you can have something that really adds a lot of pop realistic pop to your finished product okay Okay, so in this next trick, 
We're going to take a look at how you can actually have a reflective side mirror on your model. Again, nice little simple trick, add some nice detail. You need a whopping total of two tools for this job, a pen and handy dandy diagonal cutters. Now in terms of material, you just can get some of this reflective film. Uh, it's a self-adhesive. Got this right off of Amazon. And as you can see, to get a big sheet, there's actually two sheets in here. And when you consider the amount of real estate you have to cover for a side mirror, especially on a larger scale model or even a tractor model, um, you can get a lot of side mirrors out of that. It's a very simple process. I have some side mirrors here that I'm going to be working with on uh, a model and I've scraped out the insides so they're white to make them a little more visible against the chrome of the mirror itself and all you do is take these put them upside down against the backing of the film trace out with your pen go on with your diagonal cutters and clip them out and you will end up with your mirrors of course test fit drop them in there clip them as you need be to get them to the right shape so they sit in there nicely and you peel off the backing stick them in done now to give you an idea of how this will look i have here this is a revell germany doff space cab kit very nice tractor if you want to build a tractor model but if you look through the cab you can see the mirrored side mirror now this happens to be a 124 scale truck model so the mirrors are quite large which gives the ability to cut and put in but you can see the reflection on that side mirror through the cab now on a lot of 124 scale cars you may not be able to do this because the mirrors tend to be quite minuscule in size but these mirrors are from a 120th scale truck, the uh, AMT Nissan Hardbody, which I've done a full build video on, and plenty of space to work with it and put it in there. So, a few simple steps. This took me all of about 10 minutes to do for both mirrors, and it's a nice little extra effect. Otherwise, you would end up with just a chrome side mirror, and while it's it's chrome it's shiny you know it just um, it's a piece of chrome so <laughs> a little lacking in detail so next time you want to add a little detail something to give a try it only costs a couple of dollars to do